It's been another dramatic day at Westminster. The bars in that building behind me will be absolutely heaving with MPs, journalists, assistants. Well, Harry Mount and I thought we'd join them on this side of the river. Harry, welcome Cheers. to Talking Pints. Very good to see you. Now, you are, I guess, a, an aristocrat. I wouldn't say well, so. Well, I think you, you are. are. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. public school boy, writer, editor, author... Relation of David Cameron. That's all true. Amongst yeah. many things. Yeah. But your biggest sin, the thing for which you can never, must never be forgiven, is that you were a member of the Buddington Club. That is true. <laughs> now Deeply s- shaming, yeah. Now, so much. We've seen those pictures of yeah. Osborne, Cameron, yeah. Boris, dressed up in the rig, yeah. in the buller. Yeah, there you are at Oxford University. How do you get invited into this club? Uh, well, you're exactly, you're right. You're, you're asked, so you can't apply. Yep. And so you're normally asked by somebody in the year above. And the funny thing is, until those pictures of first Cameron and then Osborne appeared, it had been largely uh, forgotten that it had been going for, I can't remember, 150, 150 years or so. Yep. And people, when I was at Oxford, hadn't really even heard of it. I had heard of it, but it wasn't that well known. Then when Cameron became Tory leader, opposition leader in 2005, those pictures appeared and it was uh, like belonging to an evil cult. (laughs) (laughs) Now, tell us about some of your experiences in the Bullington Club. Well, actually, it it really, I promise you, it wasn't that dramatic. Uh, Essentially, the Bullington began as a sporting club, uh, a cricket club and a point-to-point club. It's yep. named after a little village called Bullingdon outside Oxford. I know it, yeah. And there's a point-to-point there, still is. And it began as a sporting club with drinking attached. It turned into more of a drinking club yep. with sports attached, so the club still went to the uh, point-to-point. So I promise you it really wasn't that dramatic. It's what a lot of undergraduates or young people would do. They got together and had too much to drink. But the fatal thing is wearing those silly clothes and having that group photo. And so the combination of those things, yeah. and I, I realise it's deeply, deeply embarrassing, it gave the impression that we're dressed in those things every single day of the oh, year. didn't you? No, no. <laughs> in fact, I'd only met twice a year and only on one of those days did you put on the stupid clothes. But... I freely admit it's a deeply embarrassing institution, but it, uh, its effect is greater than the actual amount of time you spent doing all that silly stuff. And some of the odd things you got involved in, being rolled down hills and there various was, things. Yeah, yeah, that, that, I wrote about that, so I must hold my hands up. I, I was at a, one of these meetings and I was in a portaloon and someone rolled me down the hill. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, deep, deep, deep embarrassment. <laughs> no, I think, um, well, I think it's funny. But, but Harry, none of this, of course, stops you. And you've had, yeah. a, you know, successful career as a journalist, written for the Specky, the Evening Standard, the Mail, the Telegraph, and you've, you know, quite prolific, actually, in, in, in the work that you turn out. The Telegraph, you were on the sort of editorial side of the Telegraph for some time. And one of the comparisons, I guess, with you and Boris Johnson is that Boris, of course, attached to the Telegraph, wrote for the Telegraph for, oh, gosh, 30-odd years, yeah. I guess, on yeah. and off. Um, and you used to work directly with him, didn't you? He would submit copy to you. And what's he like to work with? Well, he, as you know, Nigel, in the flesh, he's incredibly friendly and charming. And for five years, I edited his copy, although it didn't need any editing. It came in word yeah. perfect. Yeah. He's a good writer, isn't he's he? He's a very good writer and knows his grammar, not a single mistake. Yeah. But all the other columnists would deliver their columns by four o'clock was their deadline. Boris, because he's always a special case, delivered his at seven o'clock, except he didn't deliver it at seven. So you're right on deadline. Yeah, but he very often didn't deliver it at seven. So at one minute past seven, I'd ring him up and he's very good at saying sorry. And he'd say, I'm really sorry. I've just sent it. It's going down those jolly old copper wires of the internet. And you could hear him in the background. (laughs) Typing away, so it's the first sign of him having a difficult relationship with the truth. But at the same time, it was hard not to like him, and I did like him, and I do like him, but I think that relationship with the truth is fundamental in his downfall. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, I think we're prepared... I think the British public are prepared to forgive him more 
that they would forgive most people. But there comes a point, doesn't there, when people start to say, you know what, enough's enough. And he's still got some passionate supporters out there, particularly in the Red Wall, as I've been discussing earlier. But he's also cheesed off a pretty big chunk of them yes, as well. Yes, and this weekend was, 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 could be the death knell for his political career. Never, ever write him off. But as you said earlier on this programme... When he said he had 102 supporters, I think that relationship with the truth might be <laughs> uh, cropping up again. Um, and the other thing he's got, which is nice in his character, he's very undictatorial. He doesn't like telling people off. But I think one of the main reasons he had his downfall was his inability to tell people off. So with Owen Patterson, he should have sacked him earlier. Yeah. Uh, with Partygate... He should have clamped down on it. He's not somebody who wants to stop people having a drink, but he should have clamped down on it. And with Chris Pincher, he should have clamped down on it. And so that, in combination with his inability to tell the truth, was his downfall. So this, he is very clever. He was this really good columnist. I thought he'd be a good prime minister. I was wrong. Those fundamental flaws in his character mm. defeated that I great intelligence. And this matters to you. I mean, you know, your father worked with... Margaret Thatcher. That's right, yeah. You know, which which really important. And I yeah. love that story of, you know, you going and, 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 and as a young boy and meeting That's right, Thatcher yeah. At age, and... age 11, when my dad was the head of Maggie's policy unit, there was a party in Downing Street for Trooping the Colour. And I, as a little boy and my sister, went round asking people for all their uh, autographs. So I got a Maggie's autograph. There she was, doling out the coronation chicken. Got Cecil Parkinson's uh, autograph. White as a sheet, because I didn't know, but he just had to confess to Maggie about ah, Sarah Keys. Ah. And I went up to Dennis Thatcher and got his autograph, and I said, do you think I could get your son Mark Thatcher's autograph? And he said, well, you can ask him, but the boy can barely write. <laughs> it just <laughs> was. It was fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful yeah. sense of humour yeah. that Dennis yeah. Thatcher had. As somebody, you know, the Conservative Party, huge part of your life, the whole of your life, it's been there. Rishi Sunak takes over today. I mean, there's barely a conservative policy in sight, is there? It's social democracy that's taken it over. Yeah, but at the same time, and I think we may disagree here, I thought it was a rare example of the Tory party for the first time in uh, several years being sensible. Rishi is the sensible option. Boris, for the reasons I said, couldn't do it. No. Liz Truss was a complete embarrassment, wasn't she? And I think he's... I've met Rishi very briefly once, but I think he's... He's an intelligent man. I think he is a decent man. It's not his fault that he's married a billionaireess, is it? So I think, I think he's, I think he's the best bet. As but you he, said earlier is on, he, he conservative? is... Is he conservative? Is he conservative? Look what thought... he's done. Taxes up, the state gets ever bigger, the party becomes one based on redistribution rather than wealth creation. The assault on the self-employed. And the really, I mean, there really is an assault on the self-employed and small business company owners. What are they doing? Well... As we saw with the uh, uh, Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng budget, it's almost impossible to go against that flow towards a, a globalist, high-tax country, isn't it? And I think they did it very clumsily, Kwasi Kwarteng. And, and Liz Truss, uh, I agree with you. I wish the state was smaller. Mm. I'd have thought, I don't know, but in his heart of hearts, Rishi Sunak would agree. But the difficulty, difficulty is to be someone like... Maggie Thatcher, mm. and do unpopular things and still win elections. Have a united party behind you in the House of Commons, you can do it. Now, the other thing, Harry, that's interesting is, you know, you're on the House of Lords Appointments Commission. I mean, the fact that Liz Truss will be able to appoint members of the House of Lords, doesn't it show us what a farce that house has now become? Yes, you, you may not know, Nigel, but I, I resigned from that I know, but, you, but, yes, yes. but you accepted the I position. Did, I did accept it initially, it. and it was entirely... My fault. I, I didn't realise actually quite how limited in its powers okay. House of Lords Appointment Commission is. It's not its fault. It's my fault for not realising that. So I thought I'd be in this grand position of um, stopping people I thought was unsuitable and proposing suitable people. That actually wasn't my job. But anyway, so I, I then um, uh, resigned very shortly after accepting yeah. the job. So it was silly of me. But at the same time, um, I think it's extraordinary that um, Liz Truss should have the right, or if she's got the right, she should really yeah. not take the 115 grand a year allowance yeah. and she shouldn't hand No, I couldn't peerages. agree more. But, uh, well, who knows? She, she may be decent on those. Well, she might things. surprise us if yeah. we went prejudging. Back to writing and editing. Yeah. The oldie. Yeah. The oldie. Now, I bet there are some people watching and listening that know the oldie, but plenty that don't. Yeah. You know, Richard Ingrams, who, of yeah. course, 
helped set up Private Eye in the very beginning, set up the oldie 30 years ago. That's right, and yeah. And it's still going. Yeah, and doing very I've well. Been, I've been to a couple of the lunches, and yes. they're very, very jolly. Well, they are very jolly. One of the things we do, we have a literary lunch uh, once every month. Three speakers have written a recent book, and the uh, Stroke of Genius by uh, Richard Ingrams and the publisher, James Pembroke, uh, was limiting the speakers to 10 minutes each because we all know people who can go on for too long. Yeah. So they really have to edit their speeches beautifully. Uh, they take place at uh, lunchtime and the uh, older crowd who come to the, these lunches, they're the last people who, um, A, get stuck in to the booze <laughs> because um, they haven't got anywhere to go in the afternoon uh, and uh, re tend to be retired. But also the wonderful thing about them and the readers of the oldie is they're unshockable in this culture where we read the whole time about people being cancelled. There are little areas where you're completely free. And actually the oldie, if you read the oldie, it's, it's pushing the boundaries of, of free speech debate in a way that very few other people can. Yes, we've got, I'm so pleased to have Barry Humphreys, the great Barry Humphreys Fantastic. economist. And very often he invites his Australian friend, Celeste Patterson, uh, to write a column. And Celeste says some completely outrageous things, perhaps because he's not a real person. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> it makes but it he easier. can get away with things because he's a fictional character. Now, what is the obsession with you guys, you incredibly posh, bright guys, yeah. with Latin, speaking Latin? Boris loves to speak Latin. You've just got this. You're, and you've written many books, but yeah. Et Tu Brute is out, and I've had a flick through, the best Latin lines ever, and, and many of them actually we do use yeah. in relatively common parlance, yeah. but most folk out there have never studied Latin. Why is the language relevant? Because it is the fundamental root of Western European civilization. It's the fundamental ancient language, slightly more so with Romance languages like Latin and Spanish and French, but still today in the English language, two-thirds of the words we speak are either Latin or Greek in their roots. If you move beyond the language, take, for example, the reason why we're here with that lovely view of the Thames behind you. It's entirely because the Romans in 43 AD came up just where London Bridge is, which is the furthest east you could go and ford the river. That's why they set up Londinium mm. in 43 AD. That's why Parliament is there. That's why you have that view behind you. And over and over again, comedy, philosophy, architecture, tragedy, often the Greeks first. But the Romans... Should, we, should, should Latin be taught in schools? Yeah, definitely. And, and one of the uh, things that I say in that book, it's really upsetting that it's considered a, a posh Elitist. language. Because yeah. until the 60s and, and, and the beginning of the end of grammar schools, it was a language that was taught in a very widespread way across Britain. Um, getting rid of the grammar schools and because of people thinking it as elitist language, it's been increasingly marginalised. So now... The prophecy has been fulfilled. It is at its most rigorous way of uh, being taught, more and more restricted to public schools and yeah. a few remaining grammar schools. So people think it is a posh language. But actually, um, it's so increasing, so incredibly important, as I say, to the uh, roots of civilization, to the roots of our language. And the Romans, when they spoke it, they weren't saying posh things in Latin. No. They were betting on Ben Hur in the three thirty in Latin. They were, there's some very rude graffiti. I know. I'm yeah. going to read it all yes, cover yes, to cover. Yes, yeah. Harry, my pleasure to have you on Talking Pleasure. Thank you.